Hello everyone. I hope you are doing well. Starting from last week's video, I have switched to using a Creative Commons attribution license for my lecture videos. I plan to continue using this license for all future lecture videos on YouTube, and I will also try to relicense my older lecture videos under the same license. So, in case any of you would like to reuse my lecture video content for any purpose, be it voiceovers in a different language, sharing it to other media, or even to make memes, you can simply assume my permission. <coughs> Today's video is about Q&A. Before answering questions asked by community members, I'd like to inform you about recent Dao Yi progress. We will be launching our blog in the next few weeks. We are interested in collecting submissions for the blog from the community. So, if you would like to contribute your writing, please email us at blog at daoyi.org. We will review it briefly, then your writing will be published on Daoyi website. Questions answered in today's video include First, Tommy uh, Tumosto, Xiu Dao and the Internal Sensations. Two, Trey Parker, Silk Reeling Differences, Chen Xin vs. Chen Zhao Kui. Three, Ian Parker, Chen Style Differences, Hong Junsheng vs. Ma Hong. Four, Tai Chi Tai Chi Chuan, pausing between movements in Tai Chi Sword. Fifth, Lawrence Stacy, Tai Chi Fan Practice. Sixth, Arthur Santos, Speed Variation in Tai Chi. Seventh, Bruno Nuance, First, Wu Xing Lian Huan Quan. Eighth, Bruno Nuance, Xing Yi Fa Li. Sun style versus Hebei style. Nice. Frederick Gordon, Xing Yi mixed fist routine. <coughs> Tenth. Immortal Fate, Puch Hand variations in Xing Yi and Bagua. Eleventh. Phenomenal, Bagua training with weighted vest. Twelve. Alexi Wu Navarro, training method and culture utopianism. So, let's get started. Tommy Tomosto asked a question about internal sensation during Xiu Dao practice. Quote, I tried the Nei Dan meditation maybe 55 minutes session. I felt many different sensations. I was able to clear my mind completely so I didn't have any thought at all. Closing my eyes helped with this too. I didn't focus Xia Dan Tian but maybe Mo Shang Dan Tian. Is this a bad habit? Nevertheless, I felt energy coursing, and at the end, I felt kidneys pulsating. My dong. I ima imagined like I'm surrounded by energy of the universe all around my body and tried to relax my body, and if I noticed tension in muscle during meditation, I tried to relax them even further. Can you explain what is the meaning of the kidney pulsating or other organ pulsating. End quote. Thank you for the questions, Tommy. There are a few questions mentioned. Let me answer them one by one. First question is about focusing on Shang Dan Tian or the Upper Dan Tian. First of all, different schools focus on different areas in the beginning stage. Some schools start Xiu Dao practice by focusing on Shang Dan Tian or Upper Dan Tian, so it is not a bad habit at all. Second question is about the pulsation of kidneys or Mai Dong. Actually, it is not your kidneys pulsating. It is the entire kidney area. In Taoist practice, this area is called Ming Men or Vital Gate an important area which is located at the lower back. Some people feel it is the kidney since the area is small, but actually, it is the kidney area. 
It is a normal experience in shoot out practice. It signifies the strengthening of your vital energy and pushing through some energy gates in your body, which is a good sign. I recommend ignoring that sensation and focusing on the entire body if it happens again. Of course, there are other methods to handle it as well, but for now, Simply focus on the entire body whenever it happens. Uh, I hope that answers the question, Tommy. Let's look at the next one. <coughs> Trey Parker asks why Chen Zhao Kui used a different method of uh, silk reeling compared to Chen Xin, since Chen Xin has established the silk reeling already. He also said he applies Chen Zhao Kui's method. Uh, thank you, Trees. This is a great question since it gives me an opportunity to talk about silk reeling a bit further. Yes, Chen Xin did define silk reeling. However, definition alone cannot easily translate to practice. Chen Zhao Kui's teaching were consistent with Chen Xin's practice, but with more details added. For example, Chen Zhao Kui emphasized the concept of which fingers should lead the Tai Chi energy in the process of a silk reeling, which is the more practical approach. There is no conflict between Chen Xin and Chen Zhao Kui's practice, and the difference is that Chen Xin's writing is more fundamental and theoretical, but Chen Zhao Kui's teachings are more practical and precise in terms of physical movement of the silk reeling practice. Also, this phenomenon reflects the fact that any practice needs to be refined and developed further whenever possible. Theoretical foundation can be explained and applied in different ways, so that the theory itself can be developed further with time. Again, Chen Xin's concept is great and uh, I consider Chen Xin's contribution to Tai Chi theory is to still be the most profound and important one. Any further development based on his theory and teaching is an evolution of his contribution as long as the new concepts can improve the overall Tai Chi practice. Trace, I hope I have answered your question. Let's move on to the next one. Ian Baker asks about the differences in Chen style Tai Chi practice between the branches of Hong Junsheng and my own teacher Ma Hong. Well, this question is a bit sensitive, but I still want to give you a quick answer. First of all, I only have a little practical experience of Hong Yunsheng's form. I learned it a bit from some friends of mine who learned from Hong Yunsheng directly. As far as my main Chen style experience is concerned, I learned the most application from my uncle Yang Feng Wu and the most details of movements from Ma Hong, both of whom learned directly from Chen Zhao Kui. So, Ma Hong and my uncle both learned from Chen Zhao Kui, who learned from his father, Chen Fa Ke. Well, Hong Junsheng learned from Chen Fa Ke directly. Hong Junsheng developed his own practice based on Chen Fa Ke's teachings. Hong Junsheng's movement is very subtle and compact, and I like it a lot. I appreciate Hong's contribution. At the same time, since I practice Chen Zhao Kui's form, I have a first-hand experience and I'm able to fully appreciate and enjoy the finer details of this branch such as its opening and closing motion, silk reeling aspect, and so on. So, to answer your question, Hong Junsheng's form is more compact. Well, Chen Zhao Kui's form taught by Ma Hong focuses more on Dantian rotation. That is the brief answer I can give to you for now. I will talk more about this in future. 
Hope that answers your question, Ian. Let's move on to the next one. Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan asked about pausing between two movements. He says he had a hard time implementing pauses in the Tai Chi broad sword practice and wants to know how to treat the sword form and other weapon form in terms of whether they follow the same principle or not. Thank you, Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan. This is a good question and a frequently asked one as well. Well, the pausing motion is important in Tai Chi form practice. However, the word pause does not imply that the motion will lead to an absolute pause. It is a transition between two comparatively dynamic movements. In Tai Chi practice, nothing is purely static, since each movement continually connect to the next and the in between any two movements. There lies a pausing motion which can be either visible or invisible. However, the visibility of the pausing motion does not change the nature of the pause itself. The slower sinking motion is the time to stabilize and internalize the energy inward during Tai Chi practice and make sure the body and its structure are ready to execute the following movement. This is the nature and objective of the pulsing motion. It is a rather statically oriented dynamic motion and not a purely static one and should never be confused with a mechanical pulse. Speaking of uh, Tai Chi weapons, the Tai Chi sword and the Guan Dao can apply this concept and the practice more than the broader sword. My research indicates Chen style Tai Chi broader sword to be a much later creation than the Tai Chi Guan Dao form, which makes it harder to apply some Tai Chi principles in it. Regardless, the pulsing motion should still be there. So, I recommend you practice the pulsing motion with the Guan Dao and the Tai Chi double blade sword or Jian. Hope that answers the question, Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan. Also, please take good care in Shanghai. It is a very special time in Shanghai caused by the public health issue. So, be safe. Let's look at the next question. Lawrence Stacy asked about the significance of the fan in Tai Chi practice. Well, Tai Chi fan is a comparatively new form developed only a few decades ago. It was originally developed for the purpose of health and demonstration and not for martial applications. Of course, anything can be a weapon if you know how to use it, and the fan is no exception. Tai Chi has been diluted a lot in terms of martial application, and the creation of the Tai Chi fan form made it even worse. In the past, they created the Tai Chi fan. Tomorrow, they may even create Tai Chi twerking. So, who knows what will happen to Tai Chi? This form does not have the same practical benefits as other Tai Chi weapon practices. There's just no comparison between the Tai Chi Fan and the Tai Chi Guan Dao, the latter being a real martial weapon used by the Tai Chi founder Chen Wangting in the battlefield hundreds of years ago. So, I do not recommend the Tai Chi Fan practice to anyone. I hope that answers your question, Lawrence. Let's move on to the next one. Arthur Santos asked about speed variations in Tai Chi and how to adjust one's own speed during practice. His question refers to my video, Internal Style Concept number 42. Let me replay a clip from that video. Also, circulating energy practice has a close relationship with breathing. 
In general, the speed of breathing follows the speed of physical movement. In the context of coordination between breath and movement, normally an inhalation will accompany an inward movement, while an exhalation will accompany an outward movement. However, in fatty movement, there will always be an exhalation, never inhalation. It is an important factor to have effective fajin in terms of coordination between breathing and silk reeling movements in different directions. Thank you for the question, author. Yes, I did say that the breath follows the speed of the physical movements. I said that in order to express that in fajin movement, the breath should follow the speed of a physical movement. In other words, use the body movement to guide the breathing speed. When you move fast, you breathe quickly. When you move slowly, you should also breathe slowly. I did not say that we should not change our breath before the end of one physical movement. For example, in Tai Chi slow motion practice, you may need to have a few breaths before ending a movement. What I said in the prior video was specifically used to indicate the relationship between breathing movements and physical movements. Regarding your question about speed variations in different Tai Chi styles, yes. Any style of Tai Chi will typically start slow and then gradually up alter the speed. And the Yang style of Tai Chi is no exception. Also, there is no correlation between the speed and the quality or level of practice. In other words, an advanced level of Tai Chi practice can still be and should be practiced slowly. However, Anyone who practices Tai Chi for self-defense also needs to practice the fast movements since slow and fast practices have different objectives and provide different benefits. You cannot expect to achieve martial benefits with only slow motion Tai Chi practice. This is a very important point that every Tai Chi practitioner should be aware of. As for recommendations for Yang style Tai Chi videos, I recommend you check out Dong Yangjie's videos. Dong Yangjie was the disciple of Yang Chengfu, and his demonstrations were great and are really worth checking out. I hope I have answered your question, Arthur. Let's move on to the next one. Bruno Nuance asks two Xing Yi questions. I'd like to answer them one by one. First, who was the creator of Wu Xing Lian Huan Quan, and what is the idea behind? Well, Wu Xing Lian Huan Quan, or Five Elements Linking Form, is one of the most popular short Xing Yi routines. It is taught normally after teaching the individual five elements. Even though this routine is very short and concise, it can help practitioners practice power generation and the continuity, and continues to be popular even today. To the best of my knowledge, the linking form was created by Li Luoneng, the founder of Xing Yi. However, we do not know what his version of the linking form looked like since different branches of Xing Yi have different ways to express their own understanding even though the structure of the routine is largely identical in all the branches. I have learned many different branches of Xing Yi along with their five element linking forms, and overall, I like Li Yi's five element linking form since it is simple, concise, and has a traditional Xing Yi body structure, which is different from many modern Beijing Xing Yi structures. This is what I teach my students the most. His second question is, quote, 
Talking about power generation, what are the differences between Sun style Xingyi and the other Hebei Xingyi branches? Sun style Xingyi is just Hebei style Xingyi in power generation. Some people use the term Sun style Xingyi. Actually, there is no such style of Xingyi. Yes, Sun Lu Tang created his own style of Tai Chi after practicing Wu Hao style with Hao Wei Zhen for a couple of months. And his Tai Chi is very unique in terms of body structure and movements. While his Tai Chi is unique, his Xing Yi is not. Seriously, I cannot see any unique differences between Sun Lu Tang's Xing Yi and the other typical Hebei branch. He did not develop his Xing Yi with any unique and identifiable characteristics worthy of being separate branch. To be clear, Sun Lu Tang was a great martial artist and, and uh, I'm not criticizing his Xing Yi practice at all. I'm only saying it's not unique. A style can be recognized in the community when people can see the differences between this style and the rest. It is very hard to differentiate Sun Lu Tang's Xing Yi from other typical Hebei style Xing Yi such as Li Chun Yi, Shang Yun Xiang, Xue Dian, and Zhang Zhao Dong. I hope I have answered your question, Bruno. Let's move on to the next one. Frederick Gaudin asked a question about the mixed form routine of Xing Yi. The mixed routine of Xing Yi is not as well known as other routines like Five Elements Linking Form and the Ba Shi or Eight Posture. So, thank you, Frederick, for asking about this routine. Let me first provide a brief introduction of this routine. The name of this routine is called Zha Shi Chui or Mixed Fist. It is one of the traditional routines of Xing Yi. All of the Xing Yi branches practice this routine and it is one of the longest Xing Yi routines as it combines all five elements and the twelve animal movements into a single routine and uh, allows the practitioner to focus on continuity. It also contains some unique movements such as those of the tiger, which are not found in other routines or single movements. Che Yi Zhai, the second gen generation of Xing Yi, is agreed upon as the creator of uh, this routine. I hope that answers your question, Frederick. Let's move on to the next one. Immortal Fate asks the question, quote, Tai Chi famously practices push-ins as part of its curriculum. Are there analogous practices in Xing Yi and Ba Gua? If so, how do they compare and contrast in what skills each are intended to develop? This is the interesting question. Thank you, uh, Immortal Fate. Yes, both Xing Yi and Ba Gua have a push hand practice, but unfortunately, they are not as developed as in Tai Chi due to the nature of these styles. Push hand practice is part of the main curriculum in any Tai Chi style since it helps a Tai Chi practitioner develop the ability to sense other people's Tai Chi energy so that they eventually develop their Tai Chi skills for combat and self-defense. Well, Xing Yi and Ba Gua only practice Rou Shou or two-person exercise similar to Tai Chi push hand with the objective of practicing balance, strength, and so on. Thus, a totally different approach compared to Tai Chi. So, compared to Tai Chi, Xing Yi and Ba Gua do apply a similar practice in terms of a physical aspect, but with different objectives in mind. Hope that answers the question, Immortal Fate. Let's move on to the next one. Nominal asks, what are the pro 
and the cons of doing a part of a Ba Gua Zhang training using a weighted vest. Or perhaps how to train with waist while still preserving flexibility and not developing counterproductive muscle tensions. How to add weight to practice losing flexibility and lightness. How to recognize the signs of detrimental effects and unflexibility. Thank you for the question, uh, Nomino. Short answer Yes, it's okay to wear a weighted vest. In a prior video, I shared with the community about one of my practices when I was a child learning Bagua. My grandfather taught me to practice Bagua while holding a small concrete block when practicing Bagua. You can apply the same idea to a weighted vest. My understanding is that if the object is not too heavy, then it will not have any negative impact on your flexibility and lightness. There's the Chinese proverb, 举重若轻, translation, lift heavy things like they are very light. So, this kind of body conditioning training is great but should be practiced correctly. In other words, as long as the object is not too heavy on your body, then that will be fine. Speaking of the standard of uh, uh, determining the detrimental effects on flexibility, well, as long as your body can relax while holding a heavy object, that's fine. If you find your un entire body or major part of your body tensing up, that is the sign that your body is not ready for training with a very heavy object. So, my suggestion is to start from working on holding something not that heavy and gradually increase the weight. I hope I have answered your question, Nomino. Let's move on to the final question for today. Alex Wu Navarro asked a few questions about training method. I'd like to read his comment first. He said, quote, You made several discussions on historical utopianism and a way to discern old concepts are not necessarily better, Lao Jia versus Xin Jia, for example. How do you suggest we discern traditional martial arts when something is cultural utopianism? To me, this point made me wonder. If the traditional methods of training are, in fact, cultural utopianism as a scientific study of sports and biomechanics has many concepts that conflict with the traditional ways of training to achieve maximum performance in martial ability, for example. End quote. Uh, thank you, Alex. This is a great question. I use the term cultural utopianism to express a social phenomenon that people often falsely believe historical claims when they cannot be justified in reality. In the case of the example you mentioned, old form versus new form, I do not believe that old form is better than new form regarding the discussion about Chen style form variations. I think there are a lot of uh, commercial interests involved in these arguments. As for your specific question about traditional training method potentially conflicting with the scientific study of uh, supports and uh, biomechanics, well, I would support scientific study. However, at the same time, we should also be aware of the limitations faced by many scientific studies, which could be aspects like sample size, training objectives, training environment, and not to forget funding agencies, vested interest, and their biases. Any claim does not automatically get validated just because it is called scientific unless the claim actually holds true to the scientific method. 
any scientific research should be validated with comprehensive testing, otherwise it becomes mere propaganda, which is no better than cultural utopianism. The smallest of mistakes in the research process can often render the results invalid. Furthermore, the complexity of the human body is a huge factor which often leads to exceptions and caveats in any research result. So, in my opinion, everyone should follow the scientific method, which would include not just questioning tradition but also questioning and validating science and finding out for themselves if any scientific claims actually work for them. In all my decades worth of practice, teaching and in interacting with the martial art community, I have not seen any conflicts between scientific research and the traditional practice. Unless the so-called traditional practice was a fake to begin with, something which I am to expose and correct through this channel. I do not and never will support any false claims in martial art practice. Of course, while I can guarantee that about myself, there is only so much I can do to discourage others from making false claims. People who make unrealistic claims of a practice are actually only promoting themselves, not their arts, which the community should be able to discern. Let me summarize this with the following points about traditional training versus modern research. First, if a claim makes no rational sense whatsoever, it's a cultural utopianism. Disregard any such claims. Second, if modern research disagrees with any traditional training, find out what works best for you and stick with it. Make sure to question both and blindly follow neither. I hope I have answered your question, Alex. That brings us to the end of this month's Q&A. Thank you all for asking interesting and insightful questions and I hope you find my answers informative. Please do not hesitate to let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Quick reminder to e email us at blog at daoyi.org if you would like to have your content published on the Daoyi blog. Thank you for watching, see you next time, and enjoy your practice.